Here we go. Good evening. Welcome to this candidate forum for the Pierce County Sheriff. I'm Noel Higgins, the moderator. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our co-sponsors, we are delighted to welcome you to this virtual forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past 100 years has been to empower informed and active participation of citizens in government. Candidate forums are one of the many ways that we do this. Anyone 16 or older can be a member of the League of Women Voters. For more information on our membership, go to our website at www.tacomapiercelwd.org. Today's forum is the last in an impressive series of forums which the League has conducted for a wide range of public offices. This forum is being recorded. All of the recorded forums will be posted at the website, which again is www.tacomapiercelwd.org forward slash 2020 elections. With us tonight is Cindy Fajardo. Uh, Ed Troyer had indicated that he would be here, but he has not joined us as of yet. So we're going to proceed. I wanna introduce our timekeeper, Terry Baker from the League of Women Voters, Tacoma Pierce County. She will hold up cards to let the candidate or candidates know when you have 60 seconds remaining, 15, and when it is time to stop. When you see the stop card, you may finish a short sentence. Please stay on gallery view so you can see me and the timekeeper, Terry Baker. The audience is on mute and cannot use the chat function. Uh, we've had questions sent to us in advance and we thank those people who sent them. We may not be able to get to all of the questions because there are so very many uh, and we may consolidate similar questions in an effort to include as many concerns and issues as possible. If people in the audience wish to ask a question, you can text it to 253-861-6824. The candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. After that, the order of questions will rotate <clears throat> if our second candidate joins us and 90 seconds is the period of time for each question. And then there will be a one minute closing statement by the candidate or candidates. So let's get started with an opening statement by Cindy Fajardo. Good evening and thank you so much for having me. My name is Cindy Fajardo and I'm running to be your next Pierce County Sheriff. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I um, am a native New Yorker and I am a resident of Pierce County, the area of Roy via Colorado, where I started my law enforcement career. Both my husband and I moved here in 1988 to be part of the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. During that time, I have worked my way up from patrol deputy all the way up to lieutenant. And also during that time, I had the ability to be the contract chief for the town of Stillicum, running both their police and fire departments and it was a wonderful experience. I also am a graduate of the FBI National Academy, which is an executive leadership program designed specifically for law enforcement leaders, a three-month program back in Quantico, Virginia. I was the first commander of the Parkland Spanaway Precinct, in which I worked as the community liaison lieutenant, working with 11 different programs throughout the department that were directly connected to community building, community relations, and community service. My ancillary duties are of search and rescue. I have been both the deputy and now commander of the Pierce County Search and Rescue Unit, as well as the task force leader for the urban search and rescue team, which goes to disasters all over the nation. I've responded to 9-11, Katrina, Sandy, and most recently up in Oso. As you can see, my background is quite diversified, and I specifically put my career around the hope someday that I could lead this department. I've also have my bachelor's degree in criminal justice and my master's degree in organizational management. And I believe those will help me be your next 
Pierce County Sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with our first question. As Sheriff, how would you prevent deaths of unarmed people at the hands of law enforcement? Well, I know I only have 90 seconds to answer each one of these questions, and that is uh, quite a question to answer in such a short time. We train our officers to use the minimal amount of force necessary to affect the arrest or gain control of someone um, that we have an, a lawful authority to do so. We spend quite a bit of time tracking our interactions with our deputies and the public whenever there is any physical contact. We do our best in those situations and uh, of course, our outcome is never that we want to um, harm someone who is not a, a threat to us and who is unarmed. Um, mistakes are made throughout um, the course of our careers as we've seen throughout the nation. And as sheriff, I will make sure that my deputies receive the proper training so we are never put in that position. Thank you. This is a follow-up question. Um, in particular, how would you ensure that the people of Pierce County are not subjected to no-knock entry, chokeholds, or other potentially lethal control maneuvers? We don't do many no-knock warrants and they're very difficult to get. Um, a judge has to authorize it and you have to have quite extreme circumstances to be able to obtain that. So I don't see that as an issue here in Pierce County. Chokeholds have been banned from law enforcement for many, many years, but we do institute what we call a vascular hold, a lateral vascular hold. That is the same hold that is used in many um, wrestling moves. The MMA, it's, it's one of their um, uh, moves that they use to, to control in wrestling. Um, we apply that and we do use it as a minimal use of force. Part of the issue that comes up with that is we don't know the background of the person that we're contacting. The whole intent of using that hold is not to have to use any other physical force, but without having the physical background, the medical background, or even the, the substance background of the person that we're dealing with, um, there is a risk involved. But I think if you were to look at the number of times that the Pierce County Sheriff has applied that, uh, the, the damage or the, um, the, the um, use of it, um, it shows that it was effective. We do have in one or two cases where it, you know, we have um, some serious injury and that is one or two cases too many. So we have to refine um, the usage of that and implement other tactical methods to help our deputies and the public stay straight when we, stay, mm -hmm. stay straight when we have to get involved in those situations. I'm sorry, Noelle, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Several times in its long history, the Sheriff's Department has needed to restore public confidence in its workings. What steps should the department take at this crucial time? The community is demanding involvement within the Sheriff's Department. And I believe that that is uh, one of the minimal things that we can do to restore that confidence. If we talk about transparency and we talk about accountability, then we shouldn't be afraid of what is behind our doors. After all, it is your sheriff's department and you have the control as to what our policing looks like as citizens of Pierce County. So having community involvement and community input is one of the biggest ways to instill that confidence. Also, when the deputies are out on their street, the everyday contact that they make with people should be as positive as possible. Um, we need to interact with the community. We have to make it so we are approachable. And with doing such, we'll be able to instill that confidence. On the jail side, we have the same aspect of uh, dealing with inmates. The inmates have to have a, um, a, a feeling that they are being protected by the corrections officers that are there, the corrections deputies, to ensure that they are safe with, when they are within our facility. Thank you. Do, do you believe that systemic racism is an issue in the department? 
And if so, how would you address the issue? Well, any kind of racism within the department wouldn't be tolerated. So making sure that we have the proper training, that we are making sure that our officers are contacting the people for just cause and not because of the color of their skin, that certain actions aren't being taken because of their color of their skin. We need to monitor that and ensure that we are not propagating that type of behavior. It, it is a, a, it's a learning curve because we don't know exactly the um, the, the cause and effect of that or how deep it may or may not be. So it's one of the things that has to be addressed right off the bat to determine, you know, where we are on this level and what do we need to do to ensure that um, any kind of systemic racism or racism or mistreatment or uh, prejudice is not uh, given to the citizens or not, um, the citizens are not um, acted upon because of that. It's gonna be a long road. And again, when you have the community involved in that, you have a better chance of being successful because they can help us identify what that is and what corrections need to be made to ensure that um, that behavior is stopped. Thank you. Given the large vehicle fleet used by the Sheriff's Department, what steps would you take to bring the department to carbon neutral? Well, we have, we have certain requirements of what we need for our cars. We have so much electronics that are in those cars. We have the radios, we have the computers, we have the lights, the sirens. Um, we have charging stations for phones and flashlights. So a lot of the options that are available that would be carbon neutral at this point are not um, performing or do not perform in a way that would meet our need. The last thing we would need to happen is a deputy responding priority to somebody in need and then the car died because of the being an electric vehicle that um, we weren't able to get there. So there has steps, there has been steps taken to minimize our fleet in as far as the size of the vehicles. As you can see, we're no longer using the big Crown Victorias that got maybe two miles to the gallon. And we've gone to a more efficient um, echo driven vehicle that meets all of the other needs that we have to ensure that when we are called to a location, that we can get there um, safely. You have to understand Pierce County is still very, very rural. For the deputies out in the rural areas, they may have to drive 45 minutes in between calls back and forth all night long. So we do make, need to make sure that we provide a safe vehicle that meets the needs of what the job is that we're doing. Thank you. The new Tacoma News Tribune reported several months ago that black individuals are arrested at a higher rate than other ethnic people of other ethnic groups. What use would you as sheriff make of that information? How should the department look at itself for possible implicit bias in decisions about arrests? That report was, um, was presented by all of the departments within Pierce County, included the prosecutor's office, corrections, the sheriff's office, what we have to do and what the report does not tell us is what was the basis for that arrest? We know that there is a disproportionate amount of black people that are arrested, but why is that? Was that because of an initial officer contact? Was that because we had a 911 call that we were responding to by a third party? Was it because we received a call from a family member that was asking for our help? Or was it the result of some kind of warrant from some other incident that occurred back, uh, it could be as much as a traffic violation that causes that person to have a warrant and then be incarcerated. So until we know the root cause of why the people were arrested and why there is this disproportionality, we cannot address that those numbers. So we need more information and we need to dig down deeper and get to the root of where that information is coming from. And if it's because we are having a disproportionate um, number of contacts by law enforcement officers, then we have to look at those and find out why that is occurring. Thank you. We've talked about this a little bit, but I'm gonna, uh, this is an opportunity to speak a little more if you have something to add. And it's about racism and that's been prominent in the news. Um, and uh, 
you had referenced some training for deputies. Uh, this is a question about any key, key changes that you think would be needed in the department for it to become a truly anti-racist organization. Well, I think every chief and every sheriff would strive for that for their department. One of the things that I have always professed is that our department is not a ref true reflection of the community. And I have talked about increasing um, and making our department more diverse. Why is it that we are not getting people of color to apply for the law enforcement side of the job, but we don't have any problems getting them applying for the corrections side of the job? When we have a department that's truly diverse, we have a unity and we have a learning opportunity and we have relationships that can be built and understandings that can be shared and experiences that can be shared. And that only grows the department to becoming more neutral and, and not um, allow racism to be in play. But that is something that's going to be a, a, on my radar, but it is gonna be a long-term um, project to drill down to find out why we are not getting the applicants that we need to make us more diverse. And I do believe that is key for the advancement of the department. Thank you. How can the Sheriff's Department do an independent investigation of the Tacoma Police Department or vice versa? How could a completely independent investigation be assured in a low profile or high profile incident such as that one sur surrounding Manny Ellis? Well, we have guidance right now by the initiative um, that was passed by the voters on how um, the citizens would like or how they've demanded that these investigations be conducted. Understand that that law passed last year and we've been working on um, getting the mechanisms in place to make sure that we're complying with that initiative. And in the Manny Ellis case, it, it came up as when the prosecutor was reviewing the case that one of our deputies had arrived and assisted um, the Tacoma officers. And it was not recognized at that point as a case that would fall under that initiative. The best practice would be any time that we had a, um, a death, a in custody death, that another agency totally uh, separate from the agency that was involved, uh, be the one that does the investigation. It's a little difficult here in Tacoma and it's a new learning curve for us because we are all so short staffed that it's not unusual if one of my deputies calls for help that he's not gonna have a Lakewood officer, a Tacoma officer or a WSP officer arrive to help them. And so I believe that the governor's task force is going to address some of those issues and determine the best way forward to ensure that it is truly an independent investigation. And I would support that. Thank you. To the audience, remember you can text questions that you might have to 253-861-6824. Um, again, we, we've talked about this, but this is a little uh, slight variation here. What about the, your hiring practice? What would be your hiring practice so that only fully qualified and unbiased deputies are hired and trained? We have quite an extensive hiring practice right now. Now, does it need change? Yes, it does. And, and I will relate that. I was speaking with another candidate for another officer whose son accepted a job with Federal Way Police. And I asked, well, why not Pierce County? You live in Pierce County. And he was eliminated because he doesn't have 2020 vision. So some of the protocols I think that we're using are a little outdated and we're missing some very viable candidates. But our background on a person's social media use for associations, um, for things that they uh, have looked at over the internet is very, very extensive. And we have made significant um, uh, decisions based just on that information, which have, has eliminated candidates just because of something they may have done three, four, five, six years ago that does not comply with our hiring standards. So I would complement our background and training unit that they have already taken that steps to make sure that we are not a department that is um, hiring people who don't have the best interests in mind. 
And uh, of course, you know, we cannot guarantee that 100%. The only thing we can do is our best to make sure that that doesn't occur and use every tool available to us to also ensure that that does not occur. Thank you. What are the major needs for the department? And we talked about some of them, but uh, how would some of them be filled or satisfied if additional training is necessary, I'm sorry, additional funding is necessary in this time of budget shortfalls? I'm sorry, Noelle, okay. I didn't get the first part of that. Okay, what are the major needs of the department and how should these be filled if additional funding is necessary to meet those needs, but it's during this time of budget shortfalls? Well, the need of course is we are uh, a number of positions short and uh, the council and the executive have allowed us to move forward with our hiring. And what we're concentrating on is hiring laterals. And we're able to save a lot of money in that respect because when we hire someone to be a deputy sheriff and they have no law enforcement background, we put them on our books, of course, for salary and benefits. And then they go off to the academy for many, many months. And then they're in a field training program for many, many months. So we're looking anywhere from 12 to 14 months before we consider them to be viable. And they're still on probation at that point. So if we look to laterals from other departments and um, we, we tap that resource, we can still do very deep background checks. In fact, we had a number of Seattle officers apply for Pierce County and some, several of them were eliminated because of their backgrounds, but we did hire others. And so they can hit the streets within just a few weeks when they learn our protocols, when they learn our computer system, they already have that legal background. They already have the police knowledge. It's just having them come in and learning how we do business and what our expectations are. But especially on laterals, we're probably even more so particular because we, we need to make sure we're not getting someone else's rejects. And uh, it's a great way for us to be a good steward of the taxpayer dollar. Thank you. How should the department respond to calls where social services and or behavioral health resources are needed? Well, we've already taken those steps. So there is a fund, a grant, actually a state grant called the True Blood Monies. And from those grants, we were able to hire co-responders to partner up with deputies. And they are dispatched to calls that involved mental health issues. Now, I know there are a lot of programs throughout the nation that um, what they do is they triage the 911 calls and they have specific units that they can send that don't include law enforcement and they save the more risky calls for, for a law enforcement response. Um, and those programs uh, have been very, very successful. So we have the, the co-responder program. We also have what we call the mobile crisis intervention team. And that team deals with people who are prolific 911 callers who are in mental crises. And they've been extremely successful in getting those people treatment, getting them reemployed, getting them better housing than what they're at. So I would say probably in the last three to four years, we've worked very, very hard on this. My biggest worry, of course, is when that grant money runs out, we have to make a plan to have something in place to ensure that that can continue. Thank you. In light of the pandemic, how would you as sheriff keep safe your employees, the detainees and the public? Well, we've had to do this since March. We've been working uh, very, very hard on ensuring that, first of all, that we don't become spreaders because we deal with the public 24 seven. We're out there in people's homes. Um, uh, interacting with them and, and getting, um, you know, doing our reports. So we, we take that protocol with you know, masking gloves and uh, of course hand sanitizing because we don't have a, a sink and soap and water in our car. Um, the biggest concern of course is in the jail because it is a closed facility. And uh, I, can, I can say with, uh, with great pleasure that we have had very minimal um, positive tests within our uh, law enforcement ranks and also in the jail because of 
following the protocols that have been put forward by the health department, asking the right questions and ensuring that our employees are doing their best to follow these protocols. It is for the best safety for um, our officers and for the citizens. The last thing we need to do is have the department go down with a whole squad that's come down with uh, a COVID infection because our staffing is so low as it is. Um, we would be doing callbacks for people and keeping them on double shifts and that's not healthy for anyone involved. Thank you. The department's mission states specifically that the department, and I'm quoting, will work in partnership to build strong, safe communities. My question to you is what partnerships are important? What steps would you take to assure good relationships with other government agencies and how would you improve these relationships if needed? So what I can say is the community relations lieutenant for over 10 years, that was my primary job. And I went out into the community to develop those relationships with community groups, with neighborhood groups. Um, you know, we, we worked with um, the homeless issue on Pacific Avenue. We worked with, uh, of course, the mental health issue. Uh, we have a, a, a wonderful social media um, program where people can, can give us information about things that are going on in the community. The community and the Sheriff's Department should be hand in hand. Years ago, we had a program called the Neighborhood um, Patrol Officers or ne Neighborhood Patrol Deputies, and they were assigned, in, each were assigned an area, and they became the, the steward of that area. They knew everything that was going on there, and they were very, very involved. Uh, they, they set up senior programs. They worked with safe streets to make sure that we had groups and neighborhoods that weren't um, developed or communicating amongst themselves to build that rapport. Unfortunately, budget cuts, that program went away. Back in 2018, we started the community liaison deputies with the same kind of concept, but it was a little bit more specific around um, nuisance properties and actually targeting crime areas. But we've, in the sheriff's offices, I've always seen the benefit of having the community involved in our activities and having that one-on-one -on -one interaction so we can keep abreast on some of the things that are going on out in the public. Thank you. So this is the last question that I prepared. Um, the Pierce County Sheriff's Department services both urban and rural unincorporated areas. How do the issues confronted by sheriff's deputies differ in these two types of areas? Significantly. So in the, in the peninsula, in the mountain detachment, in the foothills detachment, um, we most frequently only have two officers on in each one of those areas. And they have to uh, rely on each other for their safety and responding to calls. Um, it's not the service that the citizens in those areas deserve. They deserve, of course, a full, a full complement of deputies. Um, but you know, it wasn't too long ago that we didn't even have 24 hour service in those areas. And then you come to the South Hill, Parkland, Spanaway um, areas that we cover. And uh, because of the density, we have to have uh, a, a larger cadre of officers to handle the volume of calls. And if you understand that it, the 911 dispatch center can receive probably 1500 calls a day for service. And of course, you know, many of them are uh, handled by online reporting, but there are a good part of those that are, are dispatched. So our officers run from call to call to call. I worry very much about the officers in the detachment because if anything was to go uh, badly, it takes a very long time for the rest of the department to get to them and to uh, offer assistance. And then the citizens themselves, if I have deputies that are in McKenna and I have somebody calling from LB saying, you know, I need help and I need help now, you know, we're talking probably even running priority a good 35 minute drive before they'll see a deputy. So we, we need to um, pay attention to the response in those areas and build the department so we can protect those citizens equally. Thank you. Hello, Ed Troyer, I'm Noel Hakins the moderator, and we were just, uh, I had just asked the last question. 
I'm sorry, we now you're and you're muted. You're you're muted. Okay, I'm would sorry. Like to... Internet connection issue. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Well, would you? Um, why don't you take um, about three minutes? Mm -hmm. Give us your opening and closing. Uh, Cindy Fajardo has answered questions, but she hasn't done her closing. So we'll get back to her, but take some time, uh, three minutes or so to give us your uh, opening, closing, and we anything you want to include. We've talked quite a bit about hiring practices and uh, concerns about racism and uh, concerns about uh, preventing deaths for unarmed uh, people in, at the hands of law enforcement. It's been sort of a wide ranging discussion. So go ahead, take three minutes and then we'll get back to Cindy for her closing statement. And then I'll uh, give some parting comments. My name is Ed Troyer and I've been with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department for 35 years. Uh, of that 35 years, I've spent 10 years in patrol, five years in investigations, and I spent um, 20 years working in our command staff with uh, retired Sheriff Paul Pastor. I'm, people that know me are gonna know I'm our public information officer and our media relations person. Uh, I also run the Amber Alert program and our child abduction response team. And some of those other programs run out of my office along with our social media. Um, a lot of the things that I do with the department are kind of dynamic like Cindy does and that we're you know, short staffed. So we know about hiring practices because uh, we all wear a lot of hats and that's just the way it's been since we've both been hired and we know that's how it's gonna be. So we're always looking for people. And when you talk about recruiting, you know, we've done a pretty good job recruiting here recently because the county executive and uh, Bruce Dammeyer and the county council has funded 28 positions for us to hire people. So what we are doing is right now we're doing really good at taking from agencies that are defunding. We just swore in four Seattle police officers last week, two of them of color, and we also have 15 more that are going through kind of a background check and being checked upon and Hopefully, if the numbers seem to pan out as last time, we'll get four or five more out of that group as well. Uh, one of the things that I've done in our department is I've worked a little bit outside the department with programs like Crime Stoppers and Charlie's Dinosaur. I'm the executive director of those programs, and I have been for over 15 years. They're 501c nonprofits, and they're designed, one, to help aid the public to give them information to help us catch suspects that are you know, felons and people that are out there hurting people and, and doing armed robberies. So that's Crime Stoppers. Charlie's Dinosaur is a program that we run to help foster kids and help the foster kids through that program uh, was helped. Uh, we started with Chuck Cox, Charlie and Braden's grandfather, and he's still friends of ours. He's still part of the nonprofit uh, program that we do. I was also on the Gambling Commission for about six and a half years, and I recently got out of that a few weeks ago uh, to make time for this. And I wasn't about to serve another four to six year term, uh, but it was interesting working at the state level and setting policy. And then I was the lead coordinator for Toys for Tots for over 10 years and the assistant coordinator for five years. And that's a program that's been near and dear to my heart since the Marines were gone and our nonprofit took it over. Uh, we distribute over 100,000 toys to kids every year through that program here in Pierce County. When we have extra, we send them to different jurisdictions and then we keep them all year round for birthday rooms and we distribute to food banks throughout Pierce County. And that's another program that I've recently left and we have a new executive director there too. So I'm getting ready to uh, move on uh, to my next adventure. And those three projects have been big projects of mine. And I was lucky enough to be a leader in all three of those and get those up and running and get some deputies and some of our people involved to help distribute and help you partake in that. And that's one of the things I'd like to do is work with community, community groups. I've been working with community groups for many years. And that's what I'd like to do is tire department and our people closer to community groups, nonprofits, faith organizations, and others that do a lot of volunteering that actually can reach out and get with the community. So I don't want to take up a lot of time. I know I'm late. I appreciate that you had me here. Um, I'm born and raised in Tacoma, Pierce County been here my whole life and the Pierce County Sheriff's Department is the only agency I've worked for and it's the only agency I'm going to work for. I plan on retiring out of this agency. 
So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Cindy Fajardo, do you want to give us your one minute closing statement and then I will uh, close out our session. You bet. Thank you again for, for having me. I think that you will see that I do have a plan. I have a vision for the future of the department and I have the experience and knowledge to make those plans come to life and to advance the department as it should be the best sheriff's department in the state of Washington. That is my goal and I'm committed to that. I'm also committed to the fact that my deputies have given me both on the correction side and also on the street side, their endorsement, as well as the dispatchers and call receivers. The Pierce County firefighters from Central Pierce, Graham, and South Pierce. And the reason they've given me their endorsement is because they have worked side by side with me, shoulder to shoulder, for the last 32 years. And they respect me for my tenacity and they respect me for the, my work ethic. And I know that the citizens of Pierce County expect nothing less, and that's what I promise to give them. I thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to. Thank the timekeeper, Terry Baker, the League of Women Voters, Tacoma Pierce County, and our co-sponsors, American Association of University Women, Central Latino, Eastside Neighborhood Council of Tacoma, the NAACP, the Tacoma Urban League, St. Leo Church, the South End Neighborhood Council of Tacoma, the Summit Waller Community Association, the YWCA of Pierce County, the University of Washington Tacoma, School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences and the Tacoma Pierce Affordable Housing Consortium. Please watch these recordings for the League of Women Voters candidate forums uh, that were held previously in September and earlier this month. You can view them at our website, www.tacomapiercelwv.org forward slash 2020 elections. Read your voters pamphlet, go to vote411.org where you can find answers to questions posed to all candidates running uh, in our state for office this time and read the candidates websites. Ballots were mailed on Friday and you should have yours. You need to return your ballot prior to 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3rd. Please return your ballot as soon as you have made your informed choices. Use one of the 46 drop boxes in our county or mail your postage paid ballot as soon as possible. Thank you for your attending and your interest. Thank you to the candidates and good night. Good night, thank you.